This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Mises Weekends. As you can see, our guest is someone who's joined us before, Daniel McAdams from the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity. Today's actually a show we had not planned. It's Friday the 13th. Uh, we had a different show in the can, but because of events this week, uh, with Donald Trump tweeting about a potential attack on Syria, we felt we had to address the elephant in the room. Uh, for those who hadn't seen it, the Mises Institute put out a statement on Thursday on our website this week from the editors against war in Syria. It's actually got some great quotes from various economists, uh, including Ludwig von Mises and Murray Rothbard, about the depravity of war. Uh, you think generally we do our show about economics, and, and Daniel, in a certain sense, war is almost outside of economics because we're no longer dealing with people in voluntary ways. We're dealing with them via force. So in, in that sense, war is an extension of politics, and it's outside of economics. But that doesn't mean people don't make money off of it. So talk about Trump's change of heart. He, it feels like he's been captured. Just a week ago, he was talking about getting out of Syria. Now we're looking at John Bolton at NSA, Mike Pompeo at State, and bombs away. What, what do you think's happened? Yeah, I think that probably was his instinct, and that's certainly what he promised on the campaign trail, that we shouldn't be staying in these places forever. If you look back at his tweets from 2013 and on, you know, you see all these, Ron Paul was right, we shouldn't have bothered in Afghanistan, we got to get out of Syria, only an idiot would attack Syria. So he has a paper trail of tweets, uh, and I think his instincts led him to say that, you know, in uh, when he was speaking before that audience in Ohio, which is a good audience uh, for that kind of thing, hey, our troops belong at home, we should bring them back home. A lot of cheers. But then the neocons did have a freak out. Uh, they went nuts. Apparently, he got a nasty phone call from Netanyahu uh-huh. uh, saying, you know, what the hell are you doing? Uh, you can't do this. Uh, and uh, so lo and behold, less than a week later, there is this uh, uh, amazing uh, chemical attack in Duma uh, that has forced him to do a complete 180. I'm sure that's entirely coincidental. Mm. Uh, but as you say, a couple of days ago, he woke up and tweeted, uh, in a way that shocked the world because it really told the Russians, bombs are coming your way, essentially. And uh, I think he's had to try to walk it back over the past 24 hours. Uh, but the marker was really laid down with that tweet. Give us a little bit of the history and background here. As as you well know, the U.S. Fed Gov is, was after Assad's father. Uh, they've been after Assad even prior to these to the so-called 2011 uprising and the Arab Spring. Uh, why Why does the West and Israel, why do they hate Assad? And, and what's driving their, their uh, monomaniacal desire to get rid of him? Well, you know, there is a pattern of U.S. intervention in Syria. As a matter of fact, the U.S. was involved in regime change there decades ago. I think it was even before uh, the 53 Iran regime change. Uh, so the U.S. has been involved in it. There was this uh, 2006 cable that was uh, leaked by WikiLeaks uh, mm-hmm. that was written by uh, one of the staff members at the embassy in Damascus who outlined in very great detail what it would take to overthrow the government of, uh, of Assad. Uh, and really, they followed that pattern. They talked about radicalizing uh, Islamists uh, and all these sorts of things. And that's pretty much the pattern they followed. So there is, you know... You, for some for some reason, U.S. foreign policy has been to overthrow uh, secular authoritarian figures in the Arab world. We saw it with Saddam Hussein. Mm-hmm. Uh, we saw it with uh, Muammar Gaddafi. <clears throat> and the results have been universally pretty bad. Uh, so here we go again, trying to do the same thing in Syria to overthrow uh, a Syrian government that's led by a, a minority, an Alawite, but the... the uh, the army itself is actually majority uh, Sunni, which most people don't realize. But uh, but basically, uh, here we go again. Uh, the neocons were not successful under Obama. Uh, he was able to resist, uh, although he, you know, certainly mm-hmm. uh, the, the idea that there was inaction is is not correct because what he did was basically a uh, an Eisenhower under Dulles. He basically said, "Okay, CIA, have at it, man. Uh, do whatever you need to do to overthrow this guy, but I don't want to invade." So we've been very active, and unfortunately, as Donald Trump is is uh, increasingly neoconized, i.e., his cabinet, uh, et cetera, I think he's gone back to that that direction. Certainly, that's what it seems like from here. Uh, 
But I just want to clarify, you're, you're disputing this, this uh, right-wing notion that Obama dropped the ball with Syria and, and that he should have been more active uh, in, in dealing with Assad during his eight years. It's the same canard that they use with Iraq. Everything would have been peachy keen there if that, if that liberal Muslim Obama had not pulled us out. Well, no, everything would have been a right. lot better there if that idiot Bush had never gone in. You know, they never yeah. looked to the antecedent if the antecedent yeah. suggests that non-interventionism would be the right cure. Uh, but no, Obama was very active. And in fact, there was an absurd point, and, and Dr. Paul and I did a show on it, where CIA-backed troops were fighting Pentagon-backed troops inside Syria. So it almost became sort of a comedy of errors, except it wasn't funny because so many people have died uh, in this essentially what's a proxy war to overthrow the Syrian government. Well, as you know, we're still hearing that uh, George Bush Sr. should have killed Saddam Hussein in 1991 or 92, and we'd all be fine today. I just want to talk about this disconnect, though, between Washington and, and the U.S. population. I think with social media, with uh, uh, you know traditional media, and, and just with the passage of time, I don't think there's any constituency out there in the country, or at least not much of one, for an actual boots on the on the ground war in Syria, I think the American people have learned at least some dim lessons from from Libya and Iraq and blowing things up. H- how do you explain why uh, unpopular wars continue to have a, a constituency in Washington? I, I don't just mean in the standard sense of the military industrial complex, but how how does support for these wars endure when they're unpopular at home? Well, I think, you know, there's a lot of psychological manipulation going on. You know, they, we've seen it over and over. The pattern continues. You remember the, in the run-up to, uh, to the first Iraq war where you had the, uh, secretly the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador to Washington appearing before Tom Lentos in the House Foreign Affairs Committee talking about babies being thrown from incubators. Mm. All a total pack of lies, but it plays on emotions. And it's, I think the war propagandists understand this, that you, you turn a basic human instinct, which is empathy, our feeling of empathy for humanity, you turn that into something that actually destroys humanity. You turn the empathy that we would have for, for what appears to be babies being harmed, <clears throat> children being hurt or killed, and you turn that into a sort of a murderous instinct demanding that we go kill someone to make up for it. And I think that's a psychological manipulation mm-hmm. that, that mobilizes the population uh, to go from being their natural instinct, which is to oppose war, to say, well, normally I'm opposed, but when I see those pictures of those kids, I say we got to have bombs away. Do you think this latest gas attack, supposed gas attack a few days ago, uh, do you think the story is a lie? I think, I think, uh, the, I think it's uh, certainly there's no evidence that it's truth. I think we have seen false flags that have been committed by these so-called white helmets. Remember, the white helmets are the only source of documentary evidence that this attack took place. Mm -hmm. Who are the White Helmets? Well, they were created by a British intelligence officer, James Le Maurier, and they've been funded by the United States uh, USAID and the UK Foreign Office to the tune of about $100 million. So these are not not just a spontaneous group of people that run in uh, Russia and helping people. They have their cameras ready, uh, they make propaganda videos, and this is the sole source of information on what happened there. Why, why would they do this? Because they, are, they have been very active with the rebels. Uh, they've been involved with the, with the rebels from the beginning. They're pro-rebel. They're pro-regime change. And the thing is, uh, Jeff, uh, I don't know what happened there. But I don't feel so bad that I don't know because just yesterday, James Mattis was before, the, uh, before Congress and he said, I don't know what happened either. Hmm. Uh, we're just we're trying to figure out what happened. I believe that he did it, but we don't have the evidence. So nobody really knows except the perpetrators at this point what happened. That's when you go into motives. Military commanders talk about second and third order effects. Let's say the United States and other Western governments start launching a bunch of serious missiles into Syria and really do destabilize or even take out Assad, what, what follows? What happens next? We've seen this time and time again. We break the egg and then we, we end up in a country for 15, 20, 30, 50 years in Korea. Well, I think before that happens, uh, and, and uh, let me just say before that, but I think what I'm about to say has been, uh, has, has been bolstered by the meeting uh, last night in the White House. The president's cabinet met. 
uh, but uh, where the where the where the uh, the Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis told the rest of them, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how to stop this escalation. He also said it to the to Congress. So to answer your question, I would say before we get to the point where the where they are destabilized to the point where Assad goes. I believe very strongly there will be a Russian retaliation, and I believe that uh, James Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, very strongly believes that there will be a Russian uh, military retaliation. Uh, the U.S. military has been on this uh, hotline to its Russian counterparts, uh, so they, they do have information, and I think that Mattis has concluded that the Russians will respond. Will they sink a couple of ships? Uh, will something mm. happen to the 2,000 troops that are illegally in northeastern Syria? I don't know what happens, but the threat of nuclear war, I think, uh, would would come first before any anything any talk about Assad going. Uh, but in terms of whether he was destabilized and overthrown, there simply is no one to replace him that's not a radical Islamist at this point. So it's it, we're replaying the scenario: Libya, uh, Iraq, over and over again. Well, you and I were both working for Dr. Paul in Washington in, that, in the early 2000s, 01 to 04, when the Afghanistan and Iraq wars began. But what feels different here is, of course, the Russians have a much more direct role. I just wonder, given how sort of fat and happy Americans are, do you think, you think our country is really mentally, psychologically prepared for a, a Cuban Missile Crisis-style tension I mean, brinksmanship with Russia, we're, we're awfully soft in this country, and I'm not sure people really understand what it means to poke a, a nuclear power. Yeah, I, I think it came to, I think President Trump's tweet focused a lot of Americans on this possibility. Uh, and I think the Russians who, who tend to not bluff when it comes to these things, they're not bombastic. They're actually rather doer uh, when it comes to talking about these things. I think the fact that they were explicit, you know, the, Leb the Russian ambassador to Lebanon told Al Manor television that, the, uh, that Russia will not only target the missiles that are incoming, but target their launchers, which would, of course, be the USS uh, Donald Cook, mm. uh, among other things. So I think Americans uh, focus now and realize that this is a serious thing. Everything that I've seen uh, points to the fact that the White House uh, switchboard has been absolutely jammed. Hmm. Uh, so there is a suggestion, and I've read it elsewhere, uh, that he's hearing a lot from people, and that doesn't necessarily change his view, but they're hearing a lot from people that do not want this war. Well, what's so frightening to me, Daniel, is that the mainstream media and even his enemies, uh, pro his progressive enemies and even his traditional GOP enemies, pat him on the back and tell him he's acting presidential when he surrounds himself with people like Bolton and, and uh, threatens war with Russia, of all places. I guess the last question I have for you is, do you think we're any better organized or prepared than we were uh, 15 years ago when, when the United States invaded Iraq? Is there, is there any way for people to, to, to work together and try to avoid or at least minimize this war in, you know, using social media, using awareness in, in ways we, we didn't have in, in 2003 when we invaded Iraq? I think so. And we mentioned this on a recent Liberty Report. And I think, uh, you know, Nassim Nicholas Taleb talks about Twitter being uh, an old fashioned, uh, uh, you know, uh, old fashioned community of a billboard, you know, a, a post board where, where, where people get together and, and talk in a, as a sort of a community. And I think that is the case to a degree, for better or for worse, because I think it all, social media is manipulated uh, by, by outside interests. However, it is easier to mobilize. You remember how it was uh, back in 2002 when we really didn't have this kind of uh, ability to talk back ability to send messages. We had to sit there listening to Judith Miller write lie after lie, day after day, with no way to it. So I think we are able to mobilize, but I also think that the bad guys are able to manipulate social media uh, and turn it into tools of psychological operations as well. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's all the time we've got. You need to be following Ron Paul Institute uh, at ronpaulinstitute.org. Follow them on Twitter. Follow Daniel McAdams on Twitter, and, and you will know everything you need to know about what's going on. You'll get a lot of inside information you won't get, obviously, from our mainstream media. We hope that this thing doesn't blow up in our faces, that it doesn't escalate, and that somehow uh, Trump's better angels uh, can sit on his shoulders this weekend, but it remains to be seen. Daniel, thanks so much for your time on, on short notice. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. 
Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.